Hello, I'm Mr King. Welcome to my first video analysing poems from the OCR Towards a World Unknown Poetry Anthology, which my students are currently studying for their English Literature GCSE. This video will be on Emily Dickinson's poem There's a Certain Slant of Light, which is one of the trickier poems in the anthology to get your head around. We'll begin by reading through the poem and checking we understand some of the language and some of the allusions she makes in the poem. Then we'll work out what the story of the poem is, i.e. what is the poem about. And if you're fairly happy with the language of the poem and the story of the poem, then feel free to skip this section and go straight to the analysis. Finally, we'll look at the language and structure of the poem and think about what we could analyse if you wanted to write about this in the exam. But before we do that, I'd like to begin with a question. Have you ever thought about death? It's not a particularly cheerful question, but it's one that's very relevant to the poem we're studying today. Today's poet, Emily Dickinson, certainly had thought about this question and wrote a number of poems about that topic. In There's a Certain Slant of Light, Dickinson tries to capture some of the un uncomfortable feelings people have when they think about death. It's not clear whether the narrator of the poem is Dickinson herself, but what is clear is that the narrator of the poem sees something outside in nature on a beautiful afternoon which makes her think about death. Let's have a look at this poem and see what Dickinson says about it. OK, so she begins. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us, we can find no scar but internal difference where the meanings are. None may teach it, any. Tis the seal despair, an imperial affliction sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens, shadows hold their breath. When it goes, tis like the distance on the look of death. Now, if you're reading that and thinking, what an earth is this about? Don't be disarmed. It is a tricky poem, which resists a single interpretation. And there is some language which is a bit unfamiliar. So let's have a look at some of the trickier language references and see if we can work out what is going on. OK, so one of the first tricky references appears in line three. And for context, I'll read the whole stanza. There's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. What's going on here? So the narrator sees a slant of light, a beam of light on a winter afternoon, which oppresses her, which makes her feel um, very upset, very hurt. And she compares it, this feeling, to the heft of cathedral tunes. What on earth does that mean? So heft is a noun which describes a heavy weight. And here she's saying that this feeling she has is heavy like cathedral music. Now heavy is a strange word to use. She's not describing a physical object, something you can touch. She's describing the sound of cathedral music. Now for me, that makes me think of organ music in a cathedral, which can be very beautiful. But it can also be very loud, very overwhelming, and very unpleasant. And that's what I think Dickinson wants us to think of here. When she sees this certain slant of light, it makes her feel oppressed. And this feeling is loud. She can't ignore it. It's overwhelming. And it's deeply unpleasant. Next, in the third stanza, there's a very strange reference to something called the seal despair. Now, this is a reference, or if you want to use the literary term, this is an allusion to an event which happens in the Bible, in the very last book of the Bible, actually, called the Book of Revelations. Now, the Book of Revelations is a book which describes the end of the world. And fairly early on in the book of Revelations, the narrator John has a vision of a scroll, like a rolled up piece of paper, like in the picture, which is sealed up 
the seven wax seals. Now he sees the Lamb of God opening this scroll by removing these seals. And every time one of the wax seals is removed, something awful happens. So for example, when the sixth seal was opened, the Bible says there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Now this image of the seals being removed and this end of the world uh, happening as a result caused so much despair that in the Bible the people who were around at the time were calling out for the mountains to fall on them because their despair was so great. So in this poem when Dickinson is writing about some very uncomfortable feelings she calls it the seal despair. She's saying that her feelings are so unpleasant it feels like the end of the world. She feels like she's watching these seals being taken off the scroll and she sees stars falling from the sky. She feels that the world is about to end. So this is a very apocalyptic form of imagery to describe her intense emotions. Finally, we have this very strange reference to an imperial affliction. So on a simple level, imperial is a word which describes a ruler like a queen or a king or a pharaoh. And affliction is a word which means pain. So on a simple level, an imperial affliction could be something like a pharaoh oppressing the slaves in ancient Egypt. It could be a Tudor monarch like King Henry VIII um, oppressing society um, and causing affliction to people like his second wife, Anne Boleyn, who he had beheaded. But I don't think Dickinson wants to think about pharaohs here or Tudor monarchs. Remember, she's talking about some very uncomfortable feelings that she has. And here she's calling this feeling an imperial affliction. And I think she's saying that this affliction, this pain she's feeling, is one which from her point of view has come from God. She is blaming God, the biggest imperial ruler, if you like, for the negative feelings she has to endure in this poem. So this is a form of hyperbole, uh, a form of exaggeration to show just how intense her negative feelings are. Okay, so that's taken us through some of the trickier references in the poem. Let's have a think about what the story of the poem is and what some of its key ideas are. So Ellen Dickinson, or her narrator, is walking about one winter afternoon when she sees a beam of light. I like to imagine a beam of light falling through a cloud or perhaps a slant of light trickling through the trees. Now normally light has positive and cheerful connotations but for some reason this beam of light makes Dickinson feel miserable as it causes her to start thinking about death. In fact, it's fair to say that in this poem, the certain slant of light is a metaphor for thoughts about death. So whenever light is referred to in this poem, think of it as a symbol of death. So, this slant of light is described as oppressing, making the narrator feel awful. This, these thoughts about death are heavy, almost like her heart is heavy when thinking about death, or perhaps the weight on her mind is too great. She even says that the oppression is like the heft of cathedral tunes. Now I don't know if you've ever been to a big beautiful cathedral like St Paul's Cathedral and heard an organ playing, because when done well an organ can sound beautiful, but when played badly an organ can be loud, overwhelming and quite unpleasant. So when she compares this beam of light, this symbol for death, when she compares her thoughts about death to the heft of cathedral tunes, I think she's saying that thinking about death is powerful and overwhelming, like listening to a bad organ in a cathedral. She then goes on to describe how painful thoughts about death are. She calls it a heavenly hurt. So thinking about death wounds her, but it doesn't hurt her on the outside. 
she says, we can find no scar. Rather, it causes her internal pain, or to use her words, it causes internal difference. Now, she says that this pain of thinking about death cannot be taught. It's so awful it can only be experienced. She goes on to say it's so bad, it's like the seal despair. Remember that allusion to the Bible which described the end of the world? She says that thinking about death is a form of extreme suffering and imperial affliction, words which imply she feels like she's being made to suffer by God as it's been sent us of the air. Try to imagine being oppressed by a king, by a pharaoh, by a government. Now try to imagine that on an even larger level, magnify that um, by 10, 100 times as you can, and imagine what it's like to be afflicted by God. And this is really what she's describing here. Now these feelings about death are so powerful, that in the last stanza, she says, it's like the landscape listens and shadows hold their breath. So this implies that thinking about death doesn't just change Dickinson as a person, it also changes the way we look at the world. The landscape listens to these thoughts of death. Shadows hold their breath. The natural world, or at least our perception of it, is altered by our thoughts about death. Finally, she ends with, in my opinion, two of the trickiest lines in the whole poem, when she says, "'Tis like the distance on the look of death. Now, I'll come back to these lines later. I think it's fair to say that these lines resist one straightforward interpretation. For now, I think it's enough to say that these lines suggest that thinking about death has a powerful impact on people. But we'll return to those lines in a few moments and I'll explore in a little more detail what I think they mean. So, to summarise, Dickinson's poem explores how people can feel when they think about death. Dickinson's narrator was prompted to think about death when she sees a certain slant of light on a winter afternoon, and she then uses lots of rich imagery and clever structural techniques to show her mixed feelings about death. So here we will move on to language and structural analysis, and what you might choose to focus on in your exam. So, let's begin with structure. The first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is her fragmented sentence structures. Just a quick glance at this poem will show that she uses lots of punctuation to really interrupt the flow of the poem. So for example, uh, we've got these um, dashes at the end of the lines here, but we've also got dashes in the middle of lines, like over here, and we've also got um, even commas and other forms of punctuation. Oh, that line's in the wrong place, never mind. But crucially, these forms of punctuation interrupt the flow of the poem. And I think that mirrors her fragmented thoughts about death. There's no one consistent thought which flows in a beautiful, straightforward way. Rather, her thoughts are jumpy, are fragmented, and that's mirrored by the punctuation. The punctuation forces us to pause in the middle of a line, and that's called a caesura, which is spelt uh, on the screen here. And we also have enjambment, which is when a line continues um, over, or when a sentence continues over a line break without any punctuation. So, for example, we have enjambment here on the final two lines. It is like the distance on the look of death. So, as there's no punctuation between the words distance and the word on, uh, this is a form of enjambment to show that, uh, unlike earlier, where the thoughts were very fragmented, here the thoughts do flow in a more uncontrollable way. This might sound quite contradictory, but I think it's fair to say that her thoughts about death are very contradictory. Sometimes they start and stop, as is reflected by the sejura, and other times they flow uncontrollably, which is reflected by the enjambment. Next, let's think about the structure of the poem, how it exists on the page. We can see that this poem is contained of four neat stanzas, or because they're made of four lines each, we could call them quatrains. And within each quatrain, we have a regular rhyme scheme. We have the second line of each poem, 
uh, of each quatrain and the fourth line of each uh, quatrain rhyming. So, for example, winter afternoons, cathedral tunes, we can find no scar, where the meanings are, tis the seal despair, send us off the air, and the landscape, uh, sorry, shadows hold their breath on the look of death. Okay. So we've got neat regular quatrains with neat regular rhyme. Now you might think that, hang on, that's a bit bizarre. We've got a very fragmented poem here with lots of enjambment, lots of sejura to show her fragmented thoughts about death. Why then are her thoughts so neat and organised? And I think this is used very ironically. I think it's ironic that her thoughts about death, which are so chaotic, are attempted to be contained in four neat quatrains. We can see the thoughts flow between the quatrains uh, easily. And I think, again, this shows how her thoughts about death overflow and cannot be contained easily. OK, let's move on to some of the language choices that Dickinson makes in this poem. So, first of all, I'd like to talk about the semantic field of violent language that Dickinson uses in the poem. So, if you're not familiar with the term semantic field, a semantic field is a group of words where all of the words have something in common. So, for example, if you take the words roller coaster, merry-go-round, candy floss, toffee apple, all of those words have something in common, which is the fun fair or theme parks. So you could say that those words have a semantic field of imagery linking to theme parks. Here, in this poem, we have another group of words with something in common. We have words like oppresses, words like scar, words like imperial affliction. And these words all have a semantic field of violent language linking them together. Why does Dickinson use this? Why does she like to use such violent imagery in this poem about death? Well, what I think she is suggesting is that these thoughts about death make her feel like she's being beaten up. These thoughts about death oppress her. They cause internal scars. They make her feel like she's suffering at the hand of an imperial ruler. And so you could make the argument that this semantic field of violent language is used to present Dickinson as a victim of thoughts about death. Next, I'd like to talk about the metaphorical language that Dickinson uses. Now, the most important form of metaphorical language Dickinson uses is the certain slant of light itself. We've already said a few times that the slant of light is a metaphor for thoughts about death. So when in the fourth quatrain, Dickinson says, when it comes, the landscape listens. So here she's presumably talking about the slant of light. When the slant of light comes, when these thoughts about death come, the landscape listens. But we also have uh, lots of similes and personification as well as examples of metaphorical language. So for example, in the first quatrain, we have like the heft of cathedral tunes. So the certain slant of light that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. Here, what I think Dickinson is saying is that these thoughts about death are heavy like unpleasant cathedral music. So try to imagine an overwhelming, unpleasant, discordant organ playing very unpleasant music. And how you feel in that moment is a bit like how she felt when she was reflecting on her thoughts about death. We also have uh, metaphorical language in the fourth quatrain. So when it comes, when the thoughts about death come, the landscape listens. Personification there. Shadows hold their breath. Again, personification. And when it goes, tis like the distance on the look of death. Another simile there. So let's unpick this metaphorical language here. When the thoughts about death come, the landscape listens and shadows hold their breath. It's almost like these thoughts about death change the narrator's view of the world. It changes the narrator's worldview. When you have thought deeply about death and the consequences of death, it will change your worldview. And here, Dickinson draws our attention to that idea by saying that the landscape itself is listening to those thoughts about death. 
and shadows seem to hold their breath. The world itself has changed or is visibly altered by these thoughts about death. It also shows how overwhelming these thoughts are if even shadows are holding their breath at the thought of death. And then we come to ambiguous imagery, which includes this final simile. Now, I've already said that this final simile, which is like the distance on the look of death, is one of the more complicated forms of imagery in the entire poem. And I don't think this line has one straightforward interpretation. I think there are a few different things you could say about it. But I think the, the main thing I would like to draw out is the following. When it goes, when these thoughts about death have gone, it is like the distance on the look of death. Now, what I think that means is when these thoughts about death have gone, we become aware of the distance between this moment in time, when we're thinking about death, and the moment in the future when we will have to look at death face to face. So when the thoughts about death have gone, we become aware of how much time, how much distance there is between now and the moment when we will inevitably die. A very negative, very uh, melancholic form of imagery and a very sad tone to end the poem with. But then again, I don't think we could expect Dickinson to write a cheerful poem on this very dark subject. So the ambiguous imagery here shows how much time is left. It makes us feel, as, poet, as a readers of this poem, quite depressed, possibly. And she shows how real and how inevitable our eventual deaths will be by personifying death, by giving death a look that one day we will have to face ourselves. We also have ambiguous imagery in the oxymoron in the second stanza. So if you look at heavenly hurt, we have this oxymoron, this contradictory language. So an oxymoron is when you have a phrase with an internal contradiction. For example, a silent scream or an ice burn. Uh, these are words which contradict each other. And heavenly hurt is another example of an oxymoron. Normally, we would associate heavenly to have positive connotations cheerful connotations, joyous connotations. But here, the image of heaven is being used to cause hurt, pain, suffering. And I think this oxymoron, this internal contradiction, reflects the contradiction within Dickinson's own mind about her thoughts about death. It shows how she feels wounded by these thoughts about death, which she talked about earlier. And I think it also shows her mixed feelings about God and religion, which have, in her view, allowed death, because she calls it an imperial affliction. So I hope you found this useful. This has been uh, my analysis of There's a Certain Slant of Light by Emily Dickinson. If you found this useful, please let me know, and I can put some more videos up about other poems in the OCR Poetry Anthology. Have a good day.